Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Bismillah. Uh, my name is Osama and I serve as the resident chaplain here at Muslim Space. And Muslim Space, we're a community organization that uh, serves the greater Austin, Texas area. Uh, we strive to provide a open and welcoming environment to all self-identifying Muslims, as well as those connected to or interested in Islam or those who wish to gather, unite, and support one another through various programming and community events, regardless of our differences in faith or anything that uh, brings us together. Uh, but since the COVID-19 pandemic, we've aimed to make our events and activities more accessible to folks outside of Austin. And we've had the privilege uh, to have people participate and join our activities from across the globe. And uh, we make it a point to be an inclusive and welcoming community space where any and all are invited, regardless of difference in faith, gender, sexual orientation, race, or any other difference. Uh, about our series tonight, Upholders of Justice, oftentimes when we think of justice, especially in the context of the world in which we live in today, we may automatically jump to thinking uh, about movements of social justice, fighting oppression, activism, and other rich examples of what we believe to be justice manifested. Um, in Islam, Muslims are enjoined to be not just just, but also to be upholders of justice, even, it is, even if it is against ourselves, as stated in the Quran. This upholding of justice is not one simply marked by collective demonstration or protest, but also includes a holistic justice that includes oneself, as well as the world and community in which one lives. In our newest monthly halakha series here today, uh, Upholders of Justice, we strive to better understand this holistic justice, as well as our obligation as Muslims to being stewards of justice, even at times when it is against ourselves. Uh, this series will be recorded to YouTube and it is being streamed to Facebook and will remain accessible for all attendees today and all those who were not able to make it with us today. Uh, we're really looking forward to our topic today on the topic of love and justice in Islam with Dr. Omid Safi. Dr. Omid Safi is a teacher in the Sufi tradition of radical love and founder of Illuminated Courses and Tours. Dr. Safi's passion for teaching has been recognized through the uh, through um, the 10 times that he's been nominated for Professor of the Year Awards. He is currently a professor at Duke University, specializing in Islamic spirituality and contemporary thought. A leading Muslim in public intellectual, Dr. Safi is committed to the intersection of spirituality and social justice. Dr. Safi has published extensively on the foundational sources of Islam and Sufism, his Memories of Muhammad وسلم, is a biography of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم. His most recent book is Radical Love, Teachings from the Islamic Mystical Tradition, published by Yale. Dr. Omid Safi is also deeply committed to liberationist prophetic traditions in the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King, Rabbi Heschel, and Malcolm X. He has been invited by the family of Dr. King to speak at Ebenezer Church on the relevance of Dr. King for today's America and has delivered the Martin Luther King keynote in the annual uh, national MLK service. Dr. Safi often appears as an expert on Islam in the New York Times, Newsweek, Washington Post, PBS, NPR, NBC, BBC, CNN, and other outlets. And he is a recent columnist for On Being and now has a podcast, Sufi Heart, at Be Here Now. His illuminated tours have taken more than a thousand friends from over 20 countries to Turkey, Morocco since 2002, and he is now offering illuminated courses for online offerings on spiritual traditions open to seekers of all backgrounds. We're really looking forward to hearing Dr. Safi uh, today bring us this, this wealth of knowledge in the intersection of love and justice within Islam. But before I uh, invite Dr. Safi to the virtual stage here to give us our, our address, uh, just wanted to give some housekeeping rules. Uh, please, if uh, when, when you are in the meeting space, please remain muted. If you have any questions that come up at any point in the lecture, please do put them in the chat. We'll keep note of them for the uh, Q&A time, or you can just message them to myself or to Muslim Space, and we will be sure to address them uh, in a timely fashion during the question and answer session. And please keep all discourse respectful to the speaker, as well as all attendees uh, in the chat and otherwise. Uh, we will be having a one of our Muslim space organization members on standby, just making sure that their space remains a safe and open space for dialogue. And if there's any concerns at any point, please do not hesitate to message me directly. And without further ado, uh, Dr. Omid Safi, I invite you to the virtual stage. Thank you for being here. All right. 
Well, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Salatu wa salam ala ashraf al-makhluqat wa sayyid al-mursaleen. Um, welcome, friends, and uh, thank you very, very much to the friends from this beautiful community for, um, for welcoming us and to having such a beautiful topic of love and justice. Um, when I heard about this series, um, The Upholders of, of Justice, I thought about a lot of the conversations that we are having in our world right now, um, conversations that we're having in this country in particular right now, and even a little bit more specifically, conversations that we're having within the Muslim community. If you look around the world, uh, in so many places, what we see is turmoil. We see places in every religious community and tradition where um, the zealots, in some ways, seem to have the upper hand. Um, if you look at the Hindu tradition and you think about the BJP and the right-wing nationalist movements, pogroms really against the Muslims in India, um, you think about um, Jewish nationalism and the ways in which, in the context of Palestine, uh, it has led to a de facto apartheid condition. Um, you'll take a look at the ways in which white Christian nationalism has um, surfaced again and again in this country and aligned itself and allied itself with the most reactionary of forces. Um, and our own tradition of, of Islam is certainly not exempt from it. And within the course of the last generation, we've seen movements from Al-Qaeda to ISIS to Wahhabism, and of course, just recently, the Taliban, inflicting the most horrific kind of atrocities all around the planet. Sometimes the response that we have had to reactionary manifestations of religion is to retreat further and further and further into a kind of private space. And some of the most well-known, most respected scholars of our community have been preaching a kind of political quietism that um, it is best, they say, perhaps best for our community to be living under a benevolent dictatorship, right? We heard this a lot in the context of Egypt, for example, um, and that rather than upholding this notion of justice as a mandate, the idea was um, the worst thing that could happen to a community would be social strife. And so there's a suspicion from this point of view of political quietism towards social movements, movements like Black Lives Matter, um, and, and, and so on. What I wanna do in our time together is to suggest that there is another option. We do have an alternative aside from either reactionary, tyrannical, oppressive models of religious nationalism on one hand, and simply retreating into that realm of quietism and personal piety on the other. And what I would propose the alternative is, is a notion of striving to become a prophetic community, a community that measures our health and our well being, indeed, our morality, based on the way that the weakest member, the most vulnerable portions of our community, are faring at the moment. 
what I want to do with your permission is to use the time that we have and talk about certain examples that we can learn from about this tradition, about this prophetic tradition. And I would argue that there's always been a prophetic Judaism, a prophetic Christianity, a prophetic Hindu tradition, and indeed a prophetic Islam. And I want us to start close to home. Uh, if you've been to a lot of talks by Muslim scholars, you're probably uh, familiar by now that in order to establish our credentials, what people like me usually try to do is to cite for you chapter and verse from the Quran and from the Sunnah and Hadith that would be unanimously agreed upon. And one can easily do that as well. I want to try something a little different here. Um, in our tradition, there is a wonderful saying and teaching, have your heart be where your feet are. Have your heart be where your feet are. That we have to fully stand where in fact we are situated. And for many of us, where we are situated is the United States of America, this land that, as the late Dr. King used to say, is simultaneously a dream and a nightmare. And I want to talk about some of the prophetic models and examples that we have had here in the United States. So with your permission, I'm going to begin by showing the images. And I trust that you all can see these right now. Is that right? Shake your head. If you can, yes, lovely. Um, so I was asked, I think, as Osama was kind enough to mention, I was invited um, to go and stand in a place that is truly as sacred to this country as Karbala would be to those of us who may come from a Shia background. And this is the balcony of Lorraine Motel in Memphis, Tennessee, where outside of room 306, Dr. King was shot and killed. So imagine being asked as a Muslim to go and stand in that hallowed ground and to share with the country. What does Martin have to say to us now? Um, of course, I accepted um, after praying over it and um, deliberating on the condition that I could bring my beautiful daughter, Layla. So that's her putting the wreath that still hangs on that balcony. And right behind her is Jesse Jackson. And right to the right of that picture is Jim Lawson, the person who brought the philosophy of nonviolence to the civil rights movement. Part of what I'm going to be sharing with you are the same teachings that I said on that day in front of these giants of the prophetic movement, the Black-led freedom movement in our country. And I want to start with a figure that's very familiar to us, Brother Malcolm. But this is a Malcolm far removed from the way that we pay homage to him once a year, and then very conveniently we put him back in the box. I want you to listen um, very briefly here to what it is, let me just actually restart this with the shared sound. Yeah, um, I want you to listen to what it is that Malcolm says upon returning from the Hajj. Sometimes we have had this erroneous perspective that says, oh, Malcolm used to be a black nationalist and then he went on the Hajj and he saw the light of Islam and he just became an Orthodox Muslim and abandoned all of his ideas about black freedom. Uh, not so. Surely going on the Hajj was a redemptive and transformative experience for Malcolm. He talks about how he saw in the Hajj the promise for a society in which white and black could be united together but his commitment to a black-led freedom movement never wavered. I want you to listen to this 
interview immediately as he lands in this country. Malcolm X. I think a lot of people confused by the new Arabic name, El Hajj Malik El Shabazz. This is always, I've always uh, had the name on my passport, Malik uh, El Shabazz, only I only used it in the Muslim world. Well, Hajj is a title that is given to any Muslim who makes the pilgrimage to Mecca during the official Hajj season. Well, are you, will you now use Shabazz and drop X? I'll probably continue to use Malcolm X because, and I'll probably use it as long as the situation that produced it exists. <laughs> we, you don't feel, you don't feel that Sh Shabazz takes the place of X? Uh, uh, my going to Mecca and going into the Muslim world, into the African world, and being recognized and accepted as a Muslim and as a brother uh, may solve the problem for me personally. But I uh, personally feel that my personal problem is never solved as long as the problem is not solved for all of our people in this country. So I remain Malcolm X as long as there is a need to protest and struggle and fight against the injustices that our people are involved in in this country. Are you prepared to go into the United um, first of all, I have never in my life seen somebody else who can go from flashing that magnificent smile to all of a sudden coming back to that fierce um, glare. If you listen to that talk carefully about that most intimate word, the name that you want to be called, and Malcolm makes a distinction between his own personal condition. I think he uses the word personal and personally three or four times. His personal condition on one hand and the systems and structures and institution of us as a people on the other hand. When we speak about justice, it's not simply about how I am personally treated or how you might be treated, it's about the systems and structures that vulnerable communities are going to be affected by. That's a really important point. As long as we have vulnerable communities, we have to stand up firmly for this conversation of justice. I want to switch a little bit here and talk about um, the other person who, of course, is so often paired with Brother Malcolm, and that's Brother Martin. And no, I'm not going to uh, play the overplayed I Have a Dream speech, um, which in some ways has become um, stripped out of the context of a movement that produced Martin. Um, when the FBI and the CIA and the Republicans and Chevrolet are all tweeting out snippets of the I Have a Dream speech, well, you kind of get a sense of how malleable and perhaps even uh, stripped of its potency it has become. What I want to do in the context of a prophetic movement, and by prophetic, I'm talking about that biblical language, uh, it's about the poor, the orphan, the needy, the widow, right? We're not calling Malcolm a prophet. We're not calling Martin a prophet. We're talking about prophetic movements, movements that say how you stand with God is measured by how you stand with the most vulnerable of people. I'm going to play for you um, these two images. This is the very first public talk that Brother Martin ever gave in his life. He was not yet the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, comma, Jr. He was not yet the Nobel Peace Prize winning Dr. King. He was not yet, as he would be called at that time, America's Black Moses. He was simply ML. King, a 26-year-old young man fresh out of the seminary who finds himself in the city of Montgomery. And the reason that he's chosen to lead the Montgomery bus boycott 
is not because he has the best resume, but it's because the old ministers who've been fighting over who's the alpha male can't decide which one of them should go. And since they can't resolve the matter, they're like, let the fresh-faced kid from out of town go. Sometimes to stand up for justice, sometimes to do that which is necessary, you need not be the most established person in the room, but you've got to have that fire in your heart. You got to know that when you see people suffering in front of you, if you don't do something and if you don't say something, the rocks are going to cry out. So Martin stands up. He would say later that at this stage of his life, 26 years old, this is his first public talk, and it's a doozy. I was going to say it's a hell of a public talk, but you probably don't want to say that about a minister. He said that it would take him three days to write each sermon. He had about an hour. He ends his talk with the following statement. And if you're used to a situation in which people are telling you to separate your concern for the poor and the needy, the orphan and the widow, the hated upon and the discriminated from your faith and from your theology, listen to these words of Martin. He stands up in that pulpit in front of 3,000 people. The crowd is spilling outside the church. And he says, we are not wrong. We are not wrong in what we are doing. If we are wrong, the Supreme Court of the United States is wrong. If we are wrong, Jesus is wrong. If we are wrong, Jesus was an idealist, romantic dreamer who never came down on earth. And the crowd is getting worked up more and more with every extraordinary statement. And he ends it by saying, if we are wrong, God Almighty is wrong. Right. And if you listen to the audio of that speech, the wave of enthusiasm and fervor and passion and fire from the crowd, it, it hits where Martin is standing, like a wave after wave, right? That's the prophetic fire. That's at the start of Martin's life. And at the end of Martin's life, he's still following in this prophetic tradition. Now he's in Riverside Church, being introduced by Heschel. He's choosing his words carefully in a speech written by my dear and beloved mentor, Vincent Harding. We have come to this magnificent house of worship because our conscience no longer permits us to remain silent. The time comes when silence is betrayal. And for us, with respect to Vietnam, that time is now. Martin goes on to say that the over there and the over here are tied up together, that the racism in America directed toward the Black community is always enmeshed in America's militarism in this unjust and immoral war on Asian soil. So he names the triplet giant of evil that is literally, he says, killing the soul of America, racism, materialism, sometimes we would say poverty, and militarism. War, racism, and exploitation of the poor. That's a prophetic tradition. So we're going to listen to just one or two little clips of Martin. And I knew that I could never again raise my voice against the violence of the oppressed in the ghettos without having first spoken clearly to the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, my own government. That statement of Martin that it's our own government, which is the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, is probably what gets him killed a year to the day at that time. 
our brother Osama started us off by reminding us of that Quranic verse, stand up for justice, speak the truth, even if it's against your own self, even if it's against your own family, even if it's against your own community. Right? That's what Martin is doing here. That's what Malcolm is doing here. If we want to be part of this prophetic tradition, that's what we got to be doing as well. We got to know the truth and to speak it in a way that is efficacious, inshallah, has barakah, but we have to speak it even if our voice shakes. That takes courage and it takes being willing to sacrifice. It sounds really glamorous to call yourself or to be called the upholder of justice. Who wouldn't want to be the upholder of justice, right? That sounds like some superhero cape that you strap on your back and you start flying in the air. The very next question that we've got to be willing to ask ourselves, what are we willing to sacrifice? Popularity, platform, access, standing, to be criticized inside our own community and certainly outside. We all know what the rules of the game are, right? You and I can sit here and criticize the Taliban and Wahhabism from now till the cows come home. It's not likely to have a particularly negative impact on our lives. But if we say something about drones, if we say something about Guantanamo, if we say something about militarism, if we say something about Israeli atrocities against Palestinians, those are the kinds of stances that come with a cost. Martin is introduced in that day by a prophetic Jewish rabbi, Rabbi Heschel. Heschel is the same one that when he goes to peace rallies, a, a young journalist says, you know, he sees this funny, short, bearded, 80-year-old rabbi, and he's like, Rabbi, what you doing here? And his answer is, uh, I'm, I'm here because I cannot pray. And the journalist doesn't get it. He's like, um, what do you mean? You're a rabbi. You pray. That's what you do. And he's like, no, my son. Every time I open up the prayer books, I see the children of Vietnam burning. So I'm here because I cannot pray. He famously prayed with his feet. And to be someone who upholds justice, sometimes you pray with the tongue. Sometimes you pray with the heart. Sometimes you pray with your glance. Sometimes you pray with your hands. Sometimes you pray with your feet. This is Heschel's famous statement that there's no limit to the concern that we have to feel for the suffering of humanity. That the only thing that is worse than evil is indifference. We have to break down the ultimate idol, which is the callousness of our own hearts. And says, if you live in a free society, some are guilty, but all are responsible. Yeah, some are guilty. Some are the ones who are actually pressing the buttons to drop bombs. But we are responsible. We cannot simply turn away and abdicate our responsibility in a society that presents itself as a representative democracy, right? These are challenging statements and truths. And these are biblical truths, Quranic truths, right? So if you know the Bible, if you know Matthew 25, that which you do to the least of these, you do want to me. Um, the great Muslim mystic Ibn Arabi um, almost translates that verbatim in the Futuhat al um, and he has an account in which 
in the hereafter, God quizzes the faithful, saying, um, I was sick and you didn't visit me. And people say, Ya Allah, you are the Lord of the heavens and the earth. How can you be sick? And God says, if you had gone to the sick, you would have found me with them. I was hungry and you didn't feed me. Ya Allah, you are Rabbul Alameen. How could we feed you? If you had gone to the hungry, you would have found me with them. If you had gone to the thirsty, you would have found me with them. And so this is that powerful Hadith tradition that is at the heart of our ethical commitment. I am with those whose hearts are broken. I am with those whose hearts are broken. This is one reason why chaplaincy is such a prophetic activity, because you are constantly going to those who are heartbroken. And any one of us who today have a voice, who can stand up, who can speak, who can act, who can organize, it's because when we were broken, and all of us have been there, somebody reached out to us, somebody held our hand, somebody picked us up. That's a prophetic action. To be an upholder of justice doesn't just mean that we go on marches. Sometimes we look around our community and we see who's broken and we go to them. And just as Malcolm asks that structural question, that institutional question, right? I'm going to go by Al Hajj Malik al Shabbaz as long as the conditions that produce suffering continue to exist. We see this among some of the liberation theologians of the Catholic tradition. If I give food to the poor, they call me a saint. But if I ask, why are they poor? They call me a communist. It is obscene. It is morally obscene to be living in the richest nation in the history of humanity and to have 20% of all of our babies, 40% of our black and brown babies go into bed hungry at night. We say we don't have money for the children. We say we don't have money for the elderly. We say we don't have money for the environment. We say we don't have money for schools. But when it comes to these immoral and unjust wars, they're printing money. No one stops to ask about the cost, the human cost and the financial cost. That's a part of the prophetic tradition. And what I want to do now is I want to shift to some of the resources from our own tradition. If you know the prophetic dimension in America, you know the late John Lewis, whom we all love and miss, when he was part of starting that group of students, 18-year-olds, 20-year-olds, who started out SNCC, one of the most powerful aspects of the civil rights movement, they linked up together love and justice. They said that we seek to build a social order of justice permeated by love. Love is the force by which, they said, God binds man to himself and man to man. Right? It's the gendered language of 1960. God binds humanity to the divine and the human to the human. Such love goes to the extreme, he said. We call that radical love. So what I want to do in the last 15 or so minutes that I've got, is I want to talk about some of the teachings that we have in our own tradition about this legacy of love and justice. You've seen how it sounds coming from Malcolm. You've seen how it sounds coming from Martin, from John Lewis, from Rabbi Heschel. Here's the way that some of our sages have talked about it. 
To begin with, we all know this wonderful verse of the Quran, right there, God commands you to justice and love. Adl, justice, and ihsan, God bless boring translators who translate this most powerful of words as spiritual excellence, right? That will really put a fire in your heart, virtue, right? What is ihsan? Ihsan is making beauty real. It's from the same root as Hassan and Hussein. God loves the muhsineen. Ihsan is that dimension of Islam that our beloved Habib was taught by Jibreel. There's the level of Islam, there's the level of Iman, but then that highest rank of faith is Ihsan. It's where you worship as if you see Allah, and if you don't, to reverse it and to remember that Allah nevertheless sees you. And that realm of love, because that's what Ihsan is, it's the love dimension, it's the beauty dimension of Islam. And it's the zenith. That realm of love is linked up together with justice. So how is it that our sages have talked about this? One of the most beautiful example of this that I've seen is the metaphor of an ocean. See love as the ocean. The ocean sometimes comes to the shore, reaches you, we call it justice there. All that we mean by justice, it's not some economic formula. It is not some mathematical analysis of how to divide up finite resources. What justice means in our tradition is think about the people you love the most in this world. If you got a baby and you love them, if you don't, you were once somebody's baby. Think about what you would wish for your baby or what your mama would wish for you. Food in your belly, a roof over your head, dignity in your bones. That's what justice is. If you love your baby, think about what you would want for them. And if you see another human being, remember that they're also somebody's baby. What you would want for your baby, wish it for them. If you wouldn't be silent if somebody is starving your baby or droning them or bombing them or occupying them, don't you dare be silent when it's somebody's black child being shot by the police or a Palestinian living under occupation or an Afghani being droned to death right when the United States is pulling out its armies from that country, link up together love and justice. We got so many examples of this in our tradition of men and women. It's astonishing to me that we in the Muslim community don't know more of the heroes and the sheroes who've been a part of our tradition. Here's Noor Anayat Khan, the daughter of the first Sufi that we know to have come over to Europe and North America, raised in the heart of a South Asian Islamic tradition, deeply committed Sufi, classically gifted musician, who also goes undercover and works as a spy to bring down the Nazis. She is captured by the Nazis, tortured brutally, and she refuses to divulge the secrets. She is ultimately martyred by the Nazis and her very last words are liberté, freedom. Right? If you want an example of love and justice in this chivalric code of courage, right? we don't have to look further than our own community and our own tradition.
So many of us, myself included, have this deep love and affection for the Habib. Our entire goal in existence is to have an opportunity to follow in his footsteps, not just by the clothes that we wear, or if you're male, the length of your beard, but he rose to see God face to face, and we want to rise and see God face to face. Right? The Mi'raj is our model. It's the paradigm of our existence. And at the zenith of the Mi'raj, when the prophet is having that face-to-face -face encounter with God, what is it that God offers him? Well, you can stay here for as long as you want, for all eternity. And his response is, Ummati, my people. So a prophetic tradition is one in which your love for Allah, your quest for that face-to-face -face encounter, and your deep compassion for humanity are intertwined. It's part of one model, one tradition. I want to share a few little examples. Um, I've been spending the last year translating um, the sayings, the aphorisms of a beautiful 11th century Sufi, a simple shepherd, right? He's like, I, I don't know much about Sharia. I've never studied Arabic. He just wandered around in the desert, pouring out his heart to God. And some of the most touching and meaningful sayings in all of our tradition. Um, here's one that he says that if you want to soften your heart fast, often. If that doesn't work, pray often. If that doesn't work, hmm. okay, you've tried fasting, you've tried praying, be mindful of every morsel of food that you take inside your mouth and give gratitude for it. If that doesn't work, if you've tried fasting, you've tried praying, you've tried mindfulness and gratitude, if none of that works, he said, there's only one last thing that I know that softens your heart. Go feed orphans. feeding the orphan was for him the most powerful of spiritual practices. We talked about that example of thinking and seeing love, experiencing love as this ocean. Sometimes love comes into public, as Cornel West says it so beautifully, when love comes into public, we call it justice. But the sages of our tradition also tell us when that same love moves inward inside of you, we call it tenderness. The commitment to justice, that radical and fierce commitment to the poor, the needy, the orphan, the occupied, the disappeared never comes at the expense of tenderness. This is one of the great mistakes and errors that I'm concerned about in our community, that the model that we have valorized for what leadership looks like, it's a male model of macho charisma, raising our voice as high as possible. Many of our greatest sages, they would alternate in public, in battle when necessary, they would be more brave than this lion, but in person, there was a softness, there was a gentleness, a kindness about them. And we should never let go of that. 
We should be working on building a community where tenderness is every bit as present as the talk of being upholders of justice. And that which modulates the two is love. That same sage, Kharaqani, if you love the folk, you love them because Allah made them. Not because they speak your language, not because they got your color of skin, not because they put their head on the ground the same way that you do. He says, whoever comes into this house, feed them. Don't ask them about their faith. If in the court of Allah Almighty, they were worthy of receiving a soul, Surely they are worthy of receiving bread in my gathering. So to have this commitment for justice and love and tenderness that transcends the bounds of race and tribe and class and even our religious community, certainly our national community. I'm going to end by just a couple of little reminders from that great master of love, Maulana Rumi. Um, this is a word of advice and um, something from a guy who had a heart attack at the age of 37. So I don't recommend living your life always by having your foot pressed against the gas pedal, um, going 100 miles an hour. Molana always reminds us that the dervishes in their whirling, they have one foot, the left foot, that is always stationary. And it's the right foot that is going around and around in circle. That this sacred movement, if you want to call it a dance, it's a dance in as much as yoga is a dance or the namaz or the salat is a dance. It's a movement, it's a praying through your body. It's a combination of movement and stillness. And one of the concerns that I have about us as a people is that we're now going on 20 years of constant movement, constant activity constantly defending our community. One of the most radical things that any of us can do, should be doing, is to create spaces for stillness, for silence, for community, for embracing each other, sitting together, eating together, for rejuvenating the heart not just doing and doing and doing until we pass out from exhaustion. That balance, that prophetic model of activity that has baraka and repose. So Rumi talks about this in many of his beautiful teachings. Let me end this portion, and then I would love to open it up for um, our, our Q&A. And I'll um, show you this story. Um, this is from Rumi's poetry. It's, it's a very powerful one. Um, it's a famous story of Layla and Majnoon that many of you no doubt know, the great love story. And they were told that the caliph had heard Majnun's descriptions of Layla. And he was infatuated with this girl. Who must she be to have inspired such beautiful poetry? So he summons all the women from Layla's village to his court. And he's tingling with excitement at the thought of getting to meet this beautiful woman. So he finally goes into the court that day, 
There's a hundred women in front of him. He's scanning all of them and he's expecting that one of these women is going to just stand out. One of them is going to be a girl of unsurpassing beauty. But they all are, you know, okay, fine. But no one of them really stands out. So he turns to his vizier, to his advisors. Did you bring Layla? Yeah, we brought Layla. He's very confused. He looks to the crowd and is like, is one of you all Layla? And Layla steps out. And he looks at her. She looks, you know, very much the same as all the other women. He says, you? You are Layla? You are that Layla that inspired all those poems? And Layla says, I am Layla. But you, you are not Majnu. And then Rumi goes on to say, in order to see the beauty of Layla, you have to learn to look through the eyes of Majnu. In order to see the beauty of Layla, you have to learn to look through the eyes of Majnu. I want to end our little time about being an upholder of justice, rooted in love, reaching inward as tenderness with this reminder that if you want to work for justice, if you want to be a part of this tradition, it requires a transformation of who we are. We have to change the way that we look at each other change the way that we speak with one another, certainly change the way that we touch one another, change the way that we listen to one another. Our faculties can become transformed, our hearts can become transformed, our community can become transformed, and inshallah then we can become a people worthy of being called the community of Muhammad. Um, I've taken quite a bit of your time. Many of these lessons would um, uh, deserve a lot more time. Those of you who are interested can go into some of the classes that um, we offer, illuminated courses. Um, but let me pause here and um, open it up to your questions. Zakla Khair, Dr. Safi, that was um, such an amazing presentation, such a wide depth of material. Uh, we really appreciate uh, you sharing that from Brother Malcolm, Brother Martin, to uh, you know, Sister uh, Nuri Nayat Khan, uh, to our own tradition, and just so much to, to, for us to, to sync with here. And uh, without kind of further ado, as you mentioned, we've got a few questions here. Um, so I don't want to uh, not give them their due diligence, but you had uh, you had mentioned here going off of Sister Sundas's question um, first off uh, that uh, the community, society, and especially the Muslim community um, has you know made this odd character uh, kind of character, this model of leadership, this macho um, male with charisma, um, all these you know the, the, this this kind of standard that's there. And uh, Sister Sundas's question, I believe hits right on that, carrying off where it leaves off, that uh, in the past weeks, we've seen religious preachers be lionized and idealized and sanctified despite serious allegations, very similar to Brother Martin's history. For some parts of the community, it was unjust to bring up these allegations when the leader did so much good like Brother Martin. To others, it was unjust not to address the truth. Is justice subjective? How do we address great leaders and teachers who also acted recklessly and unjustly? Yeah. Well, um, my uh, dear uh, sister and friend and teacher, Sundas, um, as, as so often, um, and she, she's a luminous beacon and someone that I draw um, so much hope from. And so thank you for, for that question. Um, 
as you say, it's very much a delicate question. Um, on one hand, and I'm going to do my best to speak in a way that addresses the subtlety that I think this question deserves, inshallah, without falling into the both sides kind of argument, which is um, somehow we got to be better than that. So to begin with, let's just name it. Um, the last four or five years, prominent Muslim European intellectual who confesses to having raped and seduced multiple people. Prominent Quran reciter with credible accusations of sexual impropriety against them. Prominent American teacher makes extraordinary disparaging comments about black led movements of liberation. Prominent community leader who starts an initiative that touches the lives of thousands of people and by his own reckoning transgresses in a significant way to the point that the community that he finds, that he starts, found, formally cuts ties with him at a time where his body is crippling. So it's not, it's not one bad apple or two bad apples. There's something about the mechanism by which we are producing leaders that is in need of a radical reassessment. To begin with, in today's setting, I'm not knowledgeable enough to speak about a thousand years ago, but in today's setting, a model which is 95% male and 100% masculine is a model that I don't think we can trust. A model that encourages that discrepancy between public piety and personal hypocrisy is a model that we can't trust. Uh, it's not working for us. As close as I will come to the both sides language is this. There have been many people who have received benefit and healing in communities associated with the people that we just were talking about. That can be true. And even more true is the fact that there are lives that have been destroyed, usually in silence and in private by this very same people. I think the best that I can say is the fact that some people drive, derive benefit from these gatherings um, is an indication of God's grace. What I would love to see us become is to learn something profound from the civil rights tradition, the Black-led freedom movement, where people said, Martin wasn't the one who discovered these ideas. The difference between Martin and us was that Martin was echoing to us everything that we already knew to be true in our own hearts. He was just a little bit more charismatic, eloquent than the rest of us. I would love for us to get to that point where we become a prophetic community. And then from time to time, women and men, some of them humble and private, some of them charismatic and public, mirror back and reflect to us 
truths that we've already been living into. But this idolizing and the celebrity culture that is part and parcel of the way that we go about things, um, it's something that it chews people up and it produces harm. I hope we, inshallah, can learn and get to a better place. Thank you so much for that answer, Dr. Safi. Um, and, you know, Sister Sundas as well uh, for asking that. Um, just for the sake of time, uh, we'll just take uh, these last two questions that were there. Um, and inshallah, if there are more questions, like I said, um, we'll uh, facilitate a way where we can continue the conversation, inshallah. Um, and so the next question, Dr. Safi here was, uh, going into this, this concept that you just mentioned with uh, the need for a radical reassessment, when you mentioned that uh, how often, I think you said, you know, uh, bless those uh, translators that translate Ihsan as spiritual excellence, the, sometimes that boring translation. Um, I think Aisha's question gets to that point as well of how can Ihsan, uh, a spiritual experience, uh, work with justice for all of us here? Um, the more integrated they are, then I think the more true both aspects of this wave will feel. If the conversation about justice is divorced from love and care and compassion, then it becomes pity. Um, if you spend time with poor folk, poor ordinary folk, they are extraordinary readers of humanity. They know when someone is talking down to them. They know when someone is just doing a performative act and when there's a genuine concern. Likewise, if the conversation about Ihsan is simply about a feel-goodism and a spiritual high that one can get by doing zikr or going to sama or whatever, then you're still in the cul-de-sac of the ego. Right? The self ultimately when it's healthy, it is something that is interwoven with nature and interwoven with the rest of humanity and mirroring Allah. So the more we live into our connections with the rest of humanity and the natural world and with Allah, the healthier we are. The more it is just self-centered, then um, I think the more harmful it can it can become. Thank you, Dr. Safi. I think that uh, that leads perfectly into our final question here, um, with regards to being not just connected but feeling responsible um, and holding in value all that which is around us, not just selectively ourselves or certain things that we deem to be of value. Um, I, I looking at uh, Brother Amar's question here to close us out. Uh, on this, but can you talk about how the Islamic tradition and jurisprudence has viewed responsibility to the ummah versus responsibility to the community at large? An example being choosing to whom to give one zakah. Given that resources are finite, how has our tradition balanced the need for Muslims to support other poor Muslims versus the poor in the broader uh, community? Yeah, mashallah, that's a wonderful question, uh, Brother Ammar. And I have to uh, admit that there are um, many, many areas in which I am not the most qualified person. And um, I'm certainly not a faqih. Um, there's, you know, areas perhaps about the Quran or about the Sufi tradition that I've just... Um, dip my toes into that ocean. Uh, and Islamic law is not an area. You would be much better served in asking other people. 
I think here's what I can tell you is I don't have an interest in shaming us. So I'll use a personal example. Um, my own family comes from an Iranian background. And as some of you may know, um, Iran is one of those places that the COVID um, situation has been wreaking havoc. I've lost uh, multiple family members, dozens and dozens of them have been um, tormented. So if my parents decide that for their zakat, they want to do something to alleviate the suffering that is closest to their heart, and it might be for them, somebody in Iran, for our Palestinian sisters and brothers, it might be someone in Gaza, for someone in Kashmir, Myanmar, Syria, there's no shortage, of course, of where there is need. I have zero interest in belittling their connection or uh, accusing them of a kind of tribalism or of a limited compassion or what have you. I think all I would say is, as I understand it, to be a Muslim in community with others, and as long as there have been Muslims, we have been in community with Muslims and non-Muslims, means two things. To be a part of a global ummah that by definition is anti-tribal. Right? The term Bani Adam is one of the most radical terms in the whole of the Quran. That's the superhuman tribe, if you would, that we're all a part of. So on one hand, we're striving towards being a part of the Bani Adam, the whole children of humanity. And on the other hand, we're also people called to be neighbors, good neighbors, committed neighbors. There's poor in each one of our communities. There are those who suffer in each one of our communities. Um, some people that I know and respect a lot are talking about the fact that it is legally appropriate for Muslims to use zakat to bail people out of jail. Right? That's a transformative act which has a profound consequence in my area for African-American communities and others. Do we stop to ask them, oh, before I bail you out, have you said the Shahada yet? Or do we follow that model of Kharagani, that if you were worthy of receiving a soul from Allah, surely you're worthy of receiving bread here. Um, that model appeals to me. I'm not making a legal ruling. I'm not qualified to make a legal ruling. But that notion of both being a good neighbor and working in our local communities while being mindful and aware of connections that many of us have to communities around the world, um, that strikes me as one of those situations that we have to sit with that tension rather than adopting a simple binary. And uh, may Allah guide us, inshallah, to finding the balance that best guides us and serves us. Inshallah. Jazakallah khair, Dr. Safi. And for everybody for uh, attending and asking your questions, um, this was very powerful and uh, something very hard to accomplish within an hour. But alhamdulillah, we were able to get some of those gears going. I uh, just wanted to lift up a gem i believe that came from one of dr safi's courses the the heart of the quran um that touched upon uh this element of brokenness and dr safi this was your course so feel free to correct me if i'm incorrect in what i've taken down but uh as as we're searching uh, searching for this justice this uh you know trying to work on our own brokenness uh, Dr. Safi had mentioned that I believe Shams Tabrizi had said that the one thing that God does not have is 
brokenness. Um, and so for us as humans, we that's just a part of us. And so to find that uh, wholeness to that brokenness, to that annealing, uh, to find uh, God, to, to find that connection and that wholeness within God, uh, because God is not broken. Um, so Dr. Safi, really appreciate you taking your time to uh, share these gems and wisdoms with us. Uh, we've posted the link to uh, your courses for illuminated courses in the chat for anybody that's interested to continue this conversation and uh, to see Dr. Safi's work on uh, Malcolm and Martin and uh, the Black Liberation Movement and the intersection with Islam. Uh, but Dr. Safi, thank you again for, for being with us uh, and for everybody uh, for being here as well tonight. Alhamdulillah, may everyone be, be blessed. I did want to mention mentioned that we have made a commitment that um, for anyone who signs up for any of the illuminated courses in this month that we are donating 50 percent of all the proceeds to the refugee settlement um, programs so um, if that's another um, incentive then feel free to join us as well um salamu alaikum wa rahmatullah Dr. Safi. Um, everyone, uh, if you would like, uh, our, this is a series, so we will continue, inshallah, on the third Thursday of each month. So next month, October 21st, we'll be back at it with Sister Alia Salim, the founder of FACE, Facing Abuse in Community Environments. So we can continue the conversation on not just activism and social justice, but also accountability and spiritual justice uh, amongst leaders and community environments. So inshallah, we'll see you all then. Assalamu alaikum. Have a great night.